It's my pleasure to introduce uh, David M. Dooley, president of the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Dooley earned his BA in chemistry from the University of California in San Diego and his PhD in chemistry from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He's active, he was actively engaged in teaching and research throughout his academic career. Dr. Dooley began as an assistant professor of chemistry at Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts in 1978 and left in 1973 to chair the Montana State University or Montana State Chemistry Department. Six years later, he became the interim, then full provost and vice president for academic affairs. Dr. David M. Dooley became the 11th president of the University of Rhode Island in July of 2009. He joined the university with nearly 30 years of experience in public and private higher education. Prior to joining the university, Dr. Dooley was provost and vice president of academic affairs at Montana State. He, there, he played a central role in, in that college's uh, vision, values, and core messages, and emphasized excellence in scholarship, creative work, teaching, and engagement. He brings to URI a collaborative leadership style that encourages entrepreneurial approaches to problem solving and program development. He was also appointed to serve all Rhode Islanders from the board of the Rhode Island Economic Development Committee to support efforts to renew and improve the state's economy. At Montana State, that un uh, university is now ranked as one of the top tier research universities in the country according to the Con Carnegie Foundation classification uh, and uh, honor that URI still aspires to reach as a second tier university. Earlier at Monta Montana State, Dr. Dooley led the university's chemistry and biochemistry department and served as a chemistry professor. And as a provost, he maintained an active lab laboratory and research with research funded by the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. In fact, in the first uh, year or two he was here, he still had a research group uh, going in, uh, in Montana. He's been a central figure in attracting research dollars to Montana State and helped grow their research budget to more than $100 million during his tenure there. We're looking for him to take ours to $200 million here. How's that for a goal, Dr. Dooley? Good? Uh, please welcome Dr. President David Dooley. Thank you, Ron. Uh, it's a... It's a it's a very, very special honor, and I, I want to take a minute, at the risk of taking a minute of, of time that actually would be better spent listening to Tom, just to reflect a little bit on what today means. I think all of us who care about the structures of biological macromolecules, particular proteins. So I brought a prop. This prop is a little book. I still own it. I bought it as a student. It's by two gentlemen by the name of Dickerson and Geis. It's 120 pages long, and at the time of its publication, it discussed every known protein crystal structure in existence. There were eight. <laughs> and this was, of course, before the time of computer graphics, so every structure you see in this had to be hand-drawn by Irving Geis. That's why he got top second billing as an author. He had to invent, and they did invent, how to even display structures of the sort that were becoming available. And one of the people who made all of that possible is with us today, uh, Tom Stites. Uh, Tom began his career with Bill Lipscomb, who, who also won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, Bill had found, Bill Lipscomb had found in sort of the structural biology and protein crystallography unit at Harvard. Uh, and, and Tom actually uh, contributed to the structure, one of the proteins fe featured in here, carboxypeptidase A, uh, one of the first metalloproteins, zinc metalloproteins whose structure was ever determined. And I spent my entire scientific career, and still spend part of it, uh, studying the properties, structures, and functions of metalloproteins, so particularly copper. So Tom, I have to confess this, uh, but you've always sort of been a personal hero of mine. Um, how things have changed since that time, I think none of us could have foreseen. And one of the pioneers who helped make all that possible is with us today. And it's a it's an extraordinary opportunity for all of us to, to hear Tom speak and think about and talk about uh, what he's accomplished 
over the course of his career, which I think back in the day no one would have anticipated. I think the size of structures that are done today, including the structure for which Tom won a Nobel Prize in 2009 in chemistry of the large subunit of the ribosome, were, were simply inconceivable. It was, it was part of something out there that we as scientists at the time really believed we would never understand at, that, at the atomic level. And, and many people believe that practically up until the day that, that Tom announced he had crystallized the thing and had really good diffraction uh, off of it uh, and, and was beginning a full front assault on uh, unraveling the structure of that magnificent molecular machine. So we're, we're pleased to have uh, Tom with us today and we couldn't be more honored to have you share with us your thoughts and, and ideas and uh, we look forward to your talk, and I want to stop talking now so that we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and help you not only have this great meeting on an important topic, but uh, to celebrate this marvelous new building, which is, is really good. I think that's going to greatly facilitate the uh, work of the, of the department, department the school uh, over the years. Very good. So I'm going to start out by giving a little background on uh, the ribosome structural work we've done about how to know how it functions, but then I'm going to spend the time talking about our work on finding antibiotics to the ribosome, trying to understand where they bind, how they bind, how they inhibit, um, how resistant mutations uh, arise, how, sorry, how they make it ribosome resistant, uh, and then I'm going to have a uh, section where I'm going to talk about the drug development work that Rivex Pharmaceuticals uh, have been doing. Uh, I and a couple of colleagues uh, started Rivex about 10 years ago, uh, but it will be all their work. I have nothing to do with it except laying the ground here. Uh, and then I'll uh, talk about a few other edified things at the end. So, <coughs> Computer locked again. Oh. It went through this once and then it behaved itself. And now it's not behaving itself. <laughs> we got here early, so it's seven. <laughs> and he's great, right, I have to say. He can solve just about any problem. Uh, and this has happened now. This is the second time. So we have to test it if it works. Well, we can have to start moving up to shut it down again. You said it's good, it's not. So, our initial studies were on the ribosome, uh, obviously on the large ribosome subunit, was to get the, the structure, and that was a challenge because uh, it's about, it was about 10 times larger than the next largest thing that had been solved. And there was some trickery on how one can, can do that. You have to use heavy atoms. And I, I always, I'm not looking at it today, but I, I have a slide. Uh, to show that the problem is like trying to uh, measure the weight of the ship captain with and without the ship. Uh, if you have a rowboat, I think it's pretty good. You, you can do it. But if it's the Queen Mary, uh, it, it's a challenge. Right? Uh, and, and the Latin is sort of the Queen Mary of, of uh, structures. And so we need a super heavy atom. And so what we did was use what's called a cluster compound. 18 tungstens close together, and, uh, and looked at very, very low resolution of the signal. 
and that got us and uh, go back to the beginning. Oh, okay. Uh, I better. <laughs> Anyhow, well, so that so I took out all those slides, so you won't have to hear uh, the X-ray diffraction issues of how, how we did it, and why we did it. But then the important thing to do once you get the structure of uh, this assembly or any assembly for that matter is then to look at you know, how does it bind its ligand, because you really want to look at all the functional states of a particular process. And I'll show you a movie. tested before it puts it up, I guess. Well, this is new. I haven't had this uh, problem before. Ah! That worked. Okay. All right. Now let's hope... <laughs> This is sort of preaching to the choir. You all know this uh, uh, quite extensively. And the pointer I didn't pick up. Thank you. And this was published in the Times in 2007, so it changed a lot. And that was just in the US. But uh, I think the number is closer to 100,000 a year worldwide, I'm on this thing. So, as you all know, uh, Drug resistance is an ongoing problem. I thought the lecture last night by Chris was spectacular. Really putting it out there as to what's been going on and what, what should happen. <coughs> and, uh, and also, as you, as you know, um, the resistance, it starts, actually it starts particularly after uh, a drug becomes uh, generic and gets misused, or uh, boom. Uh, they, they all go that way. And so now, linazolid uh, is just starting, but it's gonna go the same way, I'm, I'm sure. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about linazolid, because that's a precursor of one of the compounds that the lab folks uh, have developed. <clears throat> and of course, the ribosome is a large target. Uh, and um, and I, I, everybody said, well, we should find another target, and I, I agree with that, but there have been billions of years when the, the little buggies have been out there deciding which one's the best target, and they selected the ribosome as a major one, so I think we should uh, realize that evolution uh, knows its way, too, so we'll continue that. So this is the structure of the 70S ribosome, and uh, <clears throat> hmm. I'm a little jerky here. So that's the tRNA in the A site. Uh, that's the B site. <laughs> uh, and uh, why, why? Why is that happening? See, that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> but look at how how complex the RNA structure is, and that's something we didn't have any idea of what the RNA was going to look like. Now, this is the largest RNA machine in the cell. Um, it's about two-thirds RNA. Um, and it was, it's just interesting for those interested in structure to see how, how the RNA hangs together. But what we want to pay attention to is how does it work and how do antibodies get in the way. So the decoding that is where the message of everybody is carrying, uh, happens on a small subject of the messenger. Thank you, Ramakrishna, for uh, 
took the leadership role in studying that. And down here, not visible, is where the anthracite is for peptidyl transferase. I'm going to spend most of my time uh, buried down this hole. Um, and <clears throat> so, so this is the structure of the large subunit as we found it in, in 2000. And again, the uh, backbone phosphates are in green, uh, the base of their sugars in white, and it's quite tightly packed. Uh, proteins are scattered about on the surface, and as I'll show you in the next slide, they also have little arms that penetrate into the middle. And here's where the atrocyte is, the, the substrate analog found at the bottom of this upper cleft. And you notice uh, it's pretty well surrounded by RNA. So one of the things that we found was the ribosome was indeed as Crick in 1968 had predicted. Uh, it's the ribosome, that is. <laughs> Since it was the first machine to make proteins, he, Crick said, how could the first machine to make protein have been a protein? It must have been something else. Oh, well, it was an RNA. And so that's true. Now, if we split this thing down the middle, like an apple, <laughs> um, what we can see here is the peptidyl transferase center, PT, and a model built polypeptide going down the tunnel. We're actually looking at structures that have the polypeptide in the tunnel, but this is for the moment just made up. <clears throat> and this is about 100 angstroms, so it goes all the way down the tunnel. And many of the antibiotics I'm going to talk about are bind in this region, <coughs> here, <coughs> and up here. <coughs> and again, you can see that the RNA is quite tightly packed, not as tightly as protein, but still amazing that some would think of that. And, and there are proteins, uh, extensions, that go into the uh, RNA and sort of stabilize, uh, I assume, uh, the yeah. RNA structure. Now, the peptidyl transferase reaction you've all uh, seen as chemistry, uh, chemistry 101. There's an A-site substrate, a tRNA with a CCA amino acid on it, and then a P-site substrate, a, peptidyl, a peptide containing substrate, with a tRNA, a CCA, uh, and a, a, a growing polypeptide on it. And the reaction that's catalyzed that uh, some of the inhibitors are going to be stopping is the attack of this alpha amino group on the carbon and carbon. Uh, to go through a tetrahedral intermediate and then break down and get the product. <clears throat> and so, um, what was done is to look at analogs of these substrates at every step. Now, we couldn't diffuse the whole tRNA into the 50S subunit, or well, now we look at the 70S with the whole tRNA. Uh, and so, the initial studies were done with these CCA analogs. Um, and uh, so we can see what all the steps are like. <clears throat> and I'm not going to show you all the steps. I'll just show you a movie <coughs> that Martin Schmain, that is very good, that is at that point, made. So again, split uh, through the exit tunnel. And there's some proteins that come into the exit tunnel. And there are probably a number of important functions that these proteins pay, play in communicating between the outside uh, and the inside here. Yeah. Uh, that's something we're interested in studying, but we, we haven't gotten there yet. But what I'm going to concentrate on is, I'm going to think inside the box, so to speak. It's going to be mostly in this box here, because this is where the peptidyl transferase reaction occurs, and then most of the antibiotics I'm going to talk about, well, not all of them, uh, are, in this, are in this area here, this line. So after lots and lots of, of, of structures, <coughs> uh, Martin Schmain uh, got this final uh, structure in which the substrates are set up for the reaction. <coughs> and so this is the P-site substrate. Uh, and 
this is the A site substrate. So the reaction is that this alpha amino group has, uh, has to attack uh, the carbonyl carbon uh, to have the reaction occur. Okay? And then we went through the whole issue of what's the, what's the mechanism of catalysis, uh, and the only thing that was in, most of it's entropy, that is the orient the substrates. Uh, but there's also some chemistry, and there's two prime hydroxyl uh, we show that is probably involved. I'm not going to go into that, I'll show you one slide on that. Uh, and this initial uh, mechanism was uh, published by Andrea Farta <coughs> in uh, early 2000. <coughs> And the idea, which is largely consistent with what's known, is the alpha uh, <coughs> amino group interacts with the hydroxyl group, acts sort of as the general base, and then it transfers, probably during, by a water molecule, to the three prime hydroxyl the proton. Chemistry. Um, <coughs> But what I want to do before going down to the antibiotics is show a movie. And I have some movies. Movies are always good in the picture. And, but in order to uh, have a movie from structures, you have to have numerous states. I mean, it'd be nice if you could have a little camera and watch molecules go through. I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. Uh, but so what you do is what was done in the first movie. You take a series of snapshots, and then you just run it, okay, and that gives you the movie. And one of the problems, one of the challenges, is that some of these states are metastable, so you have to figure out how to stabilize various intermediates in the different structure, okay? So Martin Schmain uh, had many different structures, and so what he did is he uh, made this movie, and he put it to music. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's, here's the 50th subunit, the RNA, the protein. And there's the active site. We're narrowing in on the active site. And we spend our time for the moment on the active site. And we'll focus on two parts of the ribosome, the A loop and the P loop that bind the CCAs. And so here is the, the P loop, or sorry, the P site substrate, the two base pairs, and there's the carbonyl carbon that has to be attacked, but it's being protected by this base, so it's very, so it doesn't get hydrolyzed in the absence of the other substrate. Well, then we're attacking the A-site subject. Okay, now if you made a complex with just CA, the orientation was not good for the attacking, and this pesky little base was in the way. But if you made CCA, there was an induced fit, the reorientation, and now this is oriented in order to have an attack, and there's a stabilizing water molecule. Now it's about to attack, and uh, <laughs> and it's stabilized by that water molecule to lower the transition state. Then it breaks down to give the product. So then you have the peptidyl uh, RNA here, CCA actually, uh, and there's the deacylated substrate. In the side. Now it has to go to the exit site, the E site. There's a little bit of wall in this right? <laughs> You don't really know how this goes. So, so it, it, it's wandering over to the E site. Actually, it's back. It's like, oh, it's a little and so it's going to go and bind here. So the, the thing that's of interest here is why do only deacylated tRNAs or CCAs? Uh, bind in the site and not the ones with the amino acids on it. Because there isn't enough space down here for the amino acids. So 
only the substrate that are on their way out combined with it. And then there's a final step with the peptidyl CCA to rotate by 180 degrees and uh, go back to the start. So that's, that's how the reaction works. Okay, so that's what's being inhibited by many peptidyl transferase inhibitors. Actually, Martin then went off to uh, <coughs> do his postdoc with Nagy Ramakrishna and did some great work on some factories that are involved in proteins that are in the 70s. And he made another movie. Okay, so I think he has a second career possibility. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually now in Canada uh, as, a, as a junior faculty member. But uh, I think, you know, on the side, he's going to be Okay, so now the question we're going to uh, address now is how do the antibiotics bind to the ribosome? Uh, what's the mechanism of resistance? Uh, and most importantly, particularly for this audience, how do you make use of this information to design new antibiotics? Um, and once again, I'm not going to show you every antibiotic complex. It is. Is it high enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just talk about a few categories that we've looked at. So here's uh, the tRNA uh, in the A site and some of the antibiotics that we'll, we'll mention. Um, the tuber actinomycin, capnomycin, thiamycin find here, and they're, they're effective in TB, so they're of some interest. Uh, and then uh, chloramphenicol binds uh, in the uh, binding site for the amino acid, and then uh, the macrolides are binding further down the tunnel. So I'll we'll talk a little bit about those. <clears throat> and the first thing we started with was 15 and 16 members Macrolides. Now we we had to use only certain macrolides because uh, this is archaeal ribosome. And as you know, the archaea are eukaryotes in the sky. So they sort of hung out with the, uh, eukaryotes for a million years or so before they split off on their own. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you what we did to deal with that problem eventually. But by binding antibiotics uh, that were tight binders and using millimolar concentrations, we can get them to bind. And they bind in the tunnel. And here are some various ones. And they differ in little things that are hanging off the ring, the macrolide ring. Uh, and here's where the peptide bond formation occurs. And if you look, again, in the slip ribosome, there's the macrolide binding site. There's the model polypeptide chain. Uh, and the green are residues whose mutation make the uh, ribosome resistant. <clears throat> and now if we look up the tunnel, again, that's where peptide bond formation occurs. And these are the residues whose mutation leads to resistance. And that's where the uh, macrolide binds. Uh, blocks the tunnel, I call it molecular concentration, um, prevents the egress of the polypeptide. So, uh, one of the questions we are addressed is, you know, why, why does mutation, see this is a G, and, and I'll show, show you momentarily, and, and the new bacteria, this is an A. And that A to G mutation makes macrolides of the body. How do we understand that? <clears throat> so what are the mechanisms of resistance? And mutation of that A, as I just said, to a G uh, in E. coli reduces the binding constant for erythromycin uh, and, and many, many other MLSK antibiotics by 10,000 fold. Big, big effect. Um, and, and, and as I said, that A is a G in Halo, Archimeric, Moshua, 
and many of the MLS cave antibodies do not find, like almost none of those I've showed you, uh, were able to find two to tell up in there as much as wild type plugging it. And why is this, for example? Um, that, that G, the, the pesky M2, packs right under the macro membrane. And so what we hypothesized at the time is that M2 was preventing the packing, the tight packing, uh, and also it has to be uh, desolvated at cost of some energy. So that, that's where the reduced binding concept is coming from. Because our hypothesis, we've actually now shown them that. I'll tell you, uh, that's correct. So how do you study this? <clears throat> well, one had to change the Halo-like of Maris Mortuary back to the pseudo U bacteria. So this uh, graduate student, Dachi Tu, who worked in both my lab and Peter Moore's lab, uh, and postdoc uh, Gregor Blaha, uh, decided to mutate that G in Halo Arctic Maris Mortuary to, to an A. Okay? Uh, and then see what happened. And actually doing genetics in Halo Arctic Maris Mortuary is the easiest. They're a little slow. Uh, they were able to do it. And voila, every single one of the MLSK antibodies we tried, uh, erythromycin, azithromycin, uh, all of these, <clears throat> now about. Um, so that was, that was great. <clears throat> so if you look at <clears throat> What our challenge was <coughs> with erythromycin, now in the wild type, with G, at 3 millimolar, which was saturation under our high salt conditions, uh, it didn't bind at all. But <coughs> with the G to A mutant ribosome, at 0 0.003 millimolar, it's completely bound. So we guesstimated trying to get the most interesting answer. It's about a 10,000 fold change. So that just reverses it. So that's what's happening. And then if we look at uh, the difference bound to the wild type versus the mutant, azithromycin binds tightly enough so that at 10 millimolar, we, we were able to bind it to the uh, wild type, that is with a G. And in blue, that's the position and that's where that pesky M2 is. And you can see it does displace the position of that ring. Not much. Everything's largely okay. So you can use it for drug design. Because um, you don't need to be within a few tenths of an inch. But it, it, it does move out. Uh, and um, when you have the A, it smuggles down and is more tightly. Uh, <coughs> Um, now, another issue that came up, which uh, in a sense is irrelevant at the moment, since I think we've probably solved, uh, addressed it convincingly, is whether there's a difference between uh, archaea and eukarya, eubacteria ribosomes, and the exact way the antibody found. I have to say, when we were talking to investors 10 years ago, some of them uh, brought this up and said, oh, man, yeah, this is this is not the target, that uh, how do you know that's going to work for something that's bug I said, ah, ah, I was a little nervous. Okay. <laughs> and then there was a paper published by Ada Yonad's lab in which they got a, quite a different answer to the, um, <clears throat> for the binding of erythromycin. Uh, this was also true for the other uh, antibiotic rings that we looked at, but erythromycin, um, th this was the way uh, it bound to the Halo-Ocumeris mortuai, the ring orientation, and all the antibiotic rings uh, for the uh, macrolides were bound exactly the same way in our structures. And this is the way it was in Avignonis. Actually, there were a lot of reasons why this didn't seem right 
stereochemically, but in any case. Um, we said, well, we think ours is okay, and she said, nah, nah. So, uh, how, how to prove it? So what we did, <coughs> after a little bit of hoo-ha, uh, going on for many years, uh, a graduate student, David Bulkley, a uh, postdoc at uh, Axel Innes, and a postdoc at Gregor Blaha, uh, decided to uh, look into this in the structures of the Thermos Thermophilus 70 s process that he started uh, to look at. Just repeat all the experiments on, on the UBAC period. <clears throat> and so here's erythromycin. <clears throat> that's our difference electron density map, and that's the way we placed it. And then if you superimpose uh, the erythromycin from, from that model onto what we obtained and the hail like the Maris Mortuai, it's pretty good. Exactly the same. Uh, if you look at the uh, out of units model, uh, it's orthogonal and, and it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Okay. And then if you look at azithromycin, uh, the same story, uh, it doesn't fit with uh, what the model that we got on 70 years. So, we conclude the halo Walker Maris module is just fine. Now, meanwhile, during this time, Rybex Pharmaceuticals has been using our structure to design new antibiotics that are working, right? So we already knew that this was had to be corrected. We couldn't possibly work with uh, what was the orientations that were in the <coughs> out of the model. Now, she also had a, a structure of a complex with chloramphenicol it didn't make sense to us. It didn't make sense to the Rybex people. In fact, they assumed it was wrong when they started making use of it. Uh, so here's the way chloramphenicol binds in, in, in our in the 70s structure, and it's exactly the same way that azithromycin binds uh, to Halox and Maris Mortuai. Um, um, and also, this is where the phenyl group of phenylalanine binds. Okay? Oh, sorry, I said azithromycin and isomycin. Um, so it makes sense. If between two bases, it's a binding site for the isophobic side chains of amino acids, and they all bind like this. And there's a, and there's a zinc line here. <laughs> The uh, other model has a backwards. So, um, I don't want to be pesky, but resolution. <laughs> you do have to have a high enough resolution to, to get the right answer. So what do you do with this information? And uh, as I said, there are many other compounds that have been um, found. Uh, and they all bind pretty close together. So the different families of antibodies bind the large southern and nearby but different sites. And what do you do with that? Well, so there is the binding site on the scale of the ribosome. Uh, and here are just some of the antibiotics are bound uh, nearby. Uh, and, and, and so that defines territory, so to speak. Um, and so this information now uh, was, has been used by Rybex Pharmaceuticals, which is based in New Haven, to design uh, new antibiotics based on the structure of the complexes for the H, uh, Maramontia, large subunit complexes. <clears throat> and so here are some of the ones that they used, and by the way, all this stuff on antibiotic design uh, is done by the Rybex people. And I, 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 I just got the slides from them. I didn't do it. I go along the board and I'm just awed by what they're doing. But, but I'm not doing it. <coughs> Occasionally provide them with some new information that they have, but that's my <coughs> um, So here, in macro lines, 
arsenicin, axazole oils, a bunch of them define the space. So, so what you do is use that information to design new antibodies. And I suspect there's a, there's a group of folks in here who do that and other systems already. <coughs> Uh, so, for example, uh, you can combine these two and that, uh, and make modifications as I'll show, uh, and you get medazolid, which is an offspring of lenazolid, and I'll show you that it's actually better than lenazolid, uh, again, by com combining uh, lenazolid with uh, a, a out of this compound. And the other thing that you can, that they've been doing, they call it RxO2, um, is combine macrolide with a variety of things that bind in this site, for example, um, linazole. And then finally what they've been doing, and this is really the most promising um, area, and I won't be able to say very much about it, um, is they can use all of this space to say, here's the target of opportunity. Let's find, design a de novo compound that can bind here. <coughs> and so they've come up with a, a completely new class of compounds, not related chemically to any of the other ones, uh, which they call the RxO4 class. And they're looking very promised. I'll, I'll show you a little data on that. Uh, they target gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. So that's uh, very promising. Okay, so what's their strategy? And this is a slide from some time ago. I can't do that. Um, so again, uh, you, you take Linnaeus lid uh, and combine it with sparsomycin. So that's the Linnaeus lid and there's the sparsomycin. Sparsomycin, by the way, is a uh, is a rat poison. You know, it hits you perhaps as well as prokaryotes. Um, and so you have to make, you all know the problem. You have to get into the cell, you have to be non toxic, you have to get the uh, ukes, not, uh, sorry, folks, not ukes. Uh, and so they they do this combination. They fiddle around with everything. And then, of course, they look at the, <coughs> whether it inhibits new bacteria versus uh, eukaryotes, uh, and they look at the MICs. The usual thing that I'm sure all of you are doing all the time, or most of you are doing much of the time. Uh, and they find some compounds that look very good, and then they uh, go through quite a number, and eventually the MIC goes down to useful numbers, and the uh, difference between use and folks gets to be useful. Um, so that's the process, and so what they what they got here uh, eventually. And here, here are some of the individuals at Rydex, Joe Epolito, she was postdoc at Rydex, and she was at Rydex for ten years. Wong Su, who's actually designing this, <clears throat> and so this is Redazolid. Uh, this is the, the company slide. Of course, company slides tend to be a little more self-promoting than typically <laughs> I would do, but it's okay. I mean, it, it gets the point. Uh, broadest spectrum oxygen, uh, and mean oral IV dosing. Um, after seeing phase two trials, it's completed phase two for company of skin and pneumonia. Uh, no myelosuppression, and and this is I mean the, the trouble with uh, the problem that uh, uh, occurs with blood uh, easily <coughs> is you can't take it for more than two weeks because you get bone bone marrow suppression. But that's not true for lenazolid, and so that means it can possibly be used for TB treatment. And they're doing tests now, and, and so far it looks very promising to have long-term treatment and might be uh, another key uh, possibility. <clears throat> and it also, if you just look at uh, different enterococci strains, 
uh, it's good against the phenazole, good against all of them, uh, whereas linazole is not, of course, making license even worse. So the enhanced macrolide, uh, now that, uh, none of the companies seem to be interested in that for um, humans, but the uh, cattle folks think this might be useful. Um, and so again, it's the same thing. You start out uh, with uh, the two, so if you look at what the MICs are for uh, azithromycin, MRSA, pneumonia, various ones, bad. Make the combination, so you made here, perfect all along. Okay. So it seems to work. And they, they have, as I said, quite a few compounds that they put together. And so the, the pathway there probably is to do it for, for um, animal um, food. And then the, the final one, uh, about which I have uh, less detail, uh, is this RxO4 class, which is the de novo uh, category. And uh, they're using a, a lot of computational approaches to, uh, to, to come up with these. Bill Jorgensen, who is uh, in the chemistry department at Yale, very good at these computational methods. And his, <coughs> um, his wife, Erin Duffy, is in charge of research at uh, at Rybex, uh, and they're doing really an amazing job. So they, they look at this space, and they, they design uh, several compounds here, uh, and then look at the, the MICs for this particular compound against these little pesky things, Staph aureus, E. coli, uh, pneumoniae, C. pneumoniae, and so on, and the MICs are all very good, whereas some of these other uh, compounds, of rather, or antibiotics, are not effective at all. Uh, and they've started a par uh, partnership with Sanofi. The problem is, as soon as they sign on to this partnership, Sanofi decides to close down its pharmaceutical lab one part of France, or we're not quite sure how this is going to go. Why is this? Obviously something that goes wrong. I think you're right on the right path. <laughs> oh, we're, we're very hopeful. <clears throat> but I think uh, what, what's, what's good here is there are many opportunities as to what to do. They have several different categories of compounds that are effective, and they're effective against gram negative as well as gram positive. I mean, heard yesterday from Chris, as I'm sure most of you know, that gram-negative uh, targets are really a, a, an increasing problem to, to focus on. So I'm very hopeful. Uh, so uh, we conclude the structures of 50S useful in designing new antibiotics. So I'm just going to mention one other uh, category of antibiotics that we've looked at, which I think might hold promise for uh, some new uh, development. And these are antibiotics that are useful against tuberculosis. This is a picture from some years ago that you might see. Uh, and you all know uh, that tuberculosis is a uh, major world health problem. Fortunately, for the moment, for the U.S., it's not uh, so major, but I think these, these XDR strains are a plane ride away, I think. So I think we have to, uh, as a country, worry about it as well. So this, this work was done uh, by a, <coughs> a graduate, then graduate student, Robin Evan Stanley, and again, Gregor Blanc, uh, a postdoc. And so what they did is they made complexes with the 70S, uh, with uh, A-site, P-site, E-site, tRNA found. So they had a co-crystal with the tRNAs in the 70S and then diffused in uh, these compounds. 
and saw that it bound, it's bound between the two subunits, and it, as I'll show you, uh, and it's interacting with the TRT. So, again, the large subunit, small <coughs> subunit, uh, A site tRNA, B site. And here is <clears throat> one of these compounds, and it's uh, interacting with both the large subunit, and I'll show you in mm -hmm. more detail, and the small subunit, and uh, the tRNAs in here as well. So if we just go on to the next slide, <clears throat> show a little more detail. So again, that's, this is where it is, <coughs> up near the decoding center. You were previously looking down here during the, uh, at the epitotransfer center. And this is the decoding center, and this is what Venki Ramakrishna's lab had studied, and they showed how the uh, message is interacting with codon and a codon interaction happens and how these two bases are helping to stabilize that to make it work very well. And he found all that. And, and these two, this is biomycin or capriomycin. They bind exactly the same way. Uh, and they interact with the tRNA. Uh, Helix 69 is from the large subunit. Helix 44 is from the small subunit. So it just ties it all together. And it appears to be stabilizing uh, the complex in the decoding uh, situation, and presumably works by preventing moving on with it. Because the, 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 it's everything stabilized here, so you can't get translocation. Well, that's all very nice, but how are you going to make use of it? Really? Um, how can you, what are you going to do with this information? Well, it turns out that um, the biomycin, capriomycin binding site shown here is uh, adjacent to two binding sites that Rama Kishnan lab and also the Henry Case lab for the hydromycin B found bind to the small ribosomal subunit. And again, they're spatially very close. What can we do with that? Mm. And then uh, if we look, so we look at yet one more. It's not really a, a, a suitable antibiotic, but it, it does inhibit protein synthesis. Again, the graduate student, uh, David Oakley, did it. And he looked at the structure of the 70S ribosome without tRNAs. And actually, I think it prevents the binding of tRNAs. And it shows it interacting with both the 70 and 50S subunit. Again, here's where it binds. That's where the tRNA is combined. And there's helix 69, that same one that the biomycin, the capricomycin we're interacting with, uh, and helix 44, and it's just spanning in between. And what it does is it flips out a couple of nucleotides, and they're, they're going to prevent the binding of tRNA. So we now look, there's biomycin binding site. Uh, in this area, interacting with, as I said, with all these cascades of characters. If you model in the tRNA from this structure, and then look at the thermal Rubin binding, these the bases that are flipped out clash. So presumably the thermal Rubin prevents the binding of the tRNA, and that's why it would inhibit it. Okay, all very nice. What are you going to do with it? And uh, the point, I think, that's of interest here is all these compounds bind close to each other. And so, in principle, I think, one could make use of this information to design new compounds. Uh, and maybe it could be effective against the XDR TB strain, which is pretty well um, resistant to all antibiotics. Uh, and try, you can either use neighboring antibiotics and tie them together, but I think the chemistry is a little, given the complexity of these of these molecules, that's probably not going to be so easy or the right thing to do. But I think the 
the, the tactic used for the RxO4 series that is saying here, here's, here's the target of opportunity with respect to binding site. We know its shape, we know its location, we know the kinds of compounds that bind there. Let's design a new family of antibiotics that bind in this region. Now, the only thing you need is money. As you all know from making new uh, pharmaceutical antibiotics, you need a great idea, you need a wonderful team, we've got that, money. And, uh, you know, TB, most pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. Uh, are not so enthusiastic about that, given the uh, market. Uh, there are some who are doing it just uh, because they think this is an important thing to do, but I think that's, that's going to be the, the road line. So then, this is my final point. <clears throat> Uh, I know uh, m many of you here are doing translational research, but starting with the basic research, I I'm not happy with the NIH move uh, towards supporting translational research uh, and taking the money away from basic research. I'm, I'm sort of biased, to say the least, but I think Translational research only arises eventually from basic research. And if you don't know what you're trying to study, uh, you're not going to do very well. So I, I think this, this proves that. And so let me just uh, finish by um, thanking those who actually did the work. And uh, this is the group that was important in the uh, initial structural work. And this was at the reception at the Nordic Museum in Stockholm on uh, the 9th of December uh, 2009. And uh, the, I have to say, the Swedes are spectacular at putting on parties. <coughs> uh, and, and every evening started with champagne. You see, everybody has a glass of champagne. Uh, even Peggy has a glass. She's hiding it, too, in the um, and so the, the, the people here, here's Ninad Bond. Uh, he was the one who got the first crystals uh, and, and started the project in 1995 um, and, and moved along quite well. And then he was joined by Paul Nissen from, Paul Nissen is, uh, from Aarhus, Denmark. He's actually gone back there. Uh, and he joined with uh, Ninod, it was really the two of them who were the prime movers for getting the structure of the, <clears throat> of the 50th subject. Uh, Jeff Hansen uh, initiated the, and did most of the antibiotic binding studies, and worked a little bit with Paul uh, and Ninod on, on the structure. Uh, and then Martin Schmain uh, joined at the lab, and he did all the substrate studies and, and is the movie man, uh, at, as well as being a super scientist. Uh, uh, Peter Moore is my long-term friend and collaborator. We were graduate students together at Harvard, and then at Cambridge, and then at Yale for more years than I want to admit, and we still have lunch together, so he's a spectacular uh, colleague. Um, and Peggy Etherton, uh, is my uh, assistant, and uh, I, I say she's sort of my memory chip. She keeps me on the straight and narrow, you know, my problem solver. So I thought she should come along as well. And so all these chaps are doing very well now. <coughs> um, and here are some others that I've mentioned: Axel Linux, uh, David Bulkley, um, Gregor Blaha, Robin Stanley. Uh, I've mentioned them, all done pretty good work, some of the RIVEX people, uh, and then and Scott Strobel's lab, this uh, postdoc uh, made, made some of the compounds, uh, the intermediates. Uh, and so that's it. I can show two more slides from Stockholm. I don't know if you want to see those. This would be small. Not a lot of exactly. Uh, so this is the the banquet. So after after the awarding of the prize and, 
handshake and all that. We go and have a banquet, uh, and um, there are 1,500 people at this banquet. Quite nice. And the, the prize winners and royalty and a few others sit at this table. Um, there is the crown princess, and there's Banky. There I am. How do you want to see her? Uh, and on, at, at the side are our guests and other Swedes who managed to be invited. Uh, and the, the thing that's amazing is these waiters carry these, these, these trays up and down and around and they don't spill a thing. They <laughs> have to be especially trained. Anyhow, so that's great. <clears throat> And then there was a, a picture taken that wound up on the front page of two uh, uh, Swedish newspapers uh, of the crown princess. Uh, she'll, she'll be the next um, queen. They, they changed the rules so now you can have a woman, a woman queen, not just a male king. Uh, and there's uh, Benke and so. So that, that was fun. Thank you. Very good.